The largest loss of life in a maritime disaster was the sinking of the Wilhelm Busloff, approximately 30 kilometers to the north of the town of Weber in today's Poland. When the ship was sunk by Soviet submarine L-13, 9,343 people lost their lives. That is to say, around six times more than were killed when the Titanic went down. The second largest loss of life ever in a maritime disaster happened around 40 kilometers from that of the sinking of the Wilhelm Gustloff, also in the Baltic Sea off the coast of Poland, and that was the Goya, which went down on the 16th of April 1945 as part of the same evacuation operation that the other ship was involved in. In this video, I shall talk about the sinking of the Goya. The Goya was a cargo ship owned by shipping company ASJ Ludwig Movinkels Rederi in Bergen, Norway. The ship, built in Oslo at the Akes Mekansi Verstead shipyard, was named after the Spanish painter Francisco de Goya. The ship was 146 metres long and 17.4 metres wide and had a capacity of 5,230 GRT, as well as a top speed of 18 knots, which is approximately 33 and a half kilometers an hour. The Goya was commissioned on the 4th of April 1940, which was rather unfortunate as it did not give its owners much time to enjoy it. Five days later, on the 9th of April 1940, Nazi Germany invaded Norway and the ship was confiscated for use by the German Navy. It ferried German troops around and when no longer needed for this served as a target ship with the 24th U flotilla, a U-boat training unit based in Memel, today Klaipeda in Lithuania. The target ship would be used in exercises as the enemy, which the U-boats had to find and destroy. In early 1945, Germany was cut in two with a large part of the Baltic coast being separated from the rest of the country. Part of East Prussia remained in German hands, but it was clear that it would fall to the Soviets. Much further to the west, the Red Army raced towards Berlin. Ships were used to evacuate people from East Prussia. It was during these operations that the Wilhelm Gustloff was sunk. The Goya had already run three missions. This was to be the fourth evacuation the Goya had participated in. This is the port of Hell at the tip of the Hell Peninsula in northern Poland. The German name for it is Hella. For most of the year it's a sleepy fishing village but it comes to life for the summer when it's a popular resort. You can find me here usually towards the end of July when this video was shot. Hell mixes large sandy beaches with the coastal forest remains of its time as a former military base and socialist era housing. Now, let's go back to, in time to the 16th of April, 1945, when the Goya docked in hell and tens of thousands of service personnel and refugees sought to escape to Germany by sea. At 0705 on that day, there was an air raid on hell. There were thousands of refugees in the port. As you can see, there would be little or no protection. The number of victims is not known, but for those that survived, the important thing was that the ship was not damaged. At around 08.30, there was a second air raid. This time, the ship was hit in its forward part, and most importantly for future events, the mine self-protection system and the submarine tracking device were knocked out, meaning that it had to rely on accompanying minesweepers. In the early afternoon, there was a third air raid, but there was no further damage to the Goya. All day long, refugees were brought across from the pier in small boats. The plan was to take 6,000 passengers. However, the ship did not stop loading, wishing to leave as few people as possible behind. The purser counted more than 7,000 people, although no records were being kept. The objective was to save as many people as possible. Most of those on board were military personnel, as there was no longer any room in the cargo holds for people. Around 1,000 remained on deck and no doubt were preparing themselves for a very cold journey. 
It was a cold evening with an air temperature of 6 degrees and the water in the Baltic Sea was 3 degrees. The Goya was packed full of people. Some might have been on the road escaping from one temporary holding point to another for the previous 10 weeks. They would have been glad to get on the ship knowing that it would take them to safety out of the reach of the Red Army and onto something more permanent, although as yet they did not know what. As some people would not have been able to get onto the ship, they no doubt considered themselves lucky. From hell there is nowhere left to run. Hell is at the end of the peninsula. Hell is surrounded on three sides by the waters of the Baltic Sea. To the south across the bay lay Gdynian Gdansk. The Red Army had been stationed there for more than one month. All the refugees could have cared about now was that they are going west of Svinomunda, which is today Svinojuszczy in Poland. The Goya was built as a cargo ship with a crew appropriate for such a freighter. It had the amount of toilets needed for its crew and not thousands of refugees. There were also many people who were wounded without any provision for medical care. Furthermore, this was the fourth voyage and in wartime conditions no proper cleaning could have been carried out between journeys. One can imagine the smell of the cargo hold. The ship had been equipped with anti-aircraft guns towards the end of 1944 and there were life jackets for around 3,500 people and lifeboats for a few hundred. In these circumstances, Captain Plunica and his crew knew that if anything happened, then most of the people on board would be lost. The other ships in the convoy were just as overcrowded and therefore there was no provision for carrying shipwrecked people. The convoy set sail at 1900 hours. The Goya was accompanied by the steamer Kronenfels built in 1944 with a GRT of 2834. The water tanker Agia built in 1942 with a GRT of 676. The dry cargo ship Mercato which had been used as a collier built in 1920 4,661 GRT and for security there were the minesweepers M256 and M328. The speed of the convoy was that of the slowest ship which in this case was the Kronenfels which could manage only around 9 knots or 16.7 kilometers per hour. No lighting was permitted. Even smoking on deck was forbidden. The orange-red glow could have attracted the enemy. It was probably known that the Wilhelm Gustloff had turned its lights on and this had led it to being spotted by a Soviet submarine. The number of passengers on the ships is not known but is generally believed to be between 15 and 20,000. At 22.30, the Kronenfels had engine problems, meaning that all the other ships had to stop and wait for it to be repaired. This took around 20 minutes, when once more the convoy could proceed. Around 2300 hours, the orders were changed. Naval High Command in Kiel ordered a change of course. The destination was changed to Copenhagen in Denmark instead of Schwinemunde. This was due to the large number of refugees the convoy was carrying, as well as the need to carry out repairs to the Kronenfels. The news of the change in destination caused rejoicing amongst the refugees as Copenhagen was much further away from the Red Army and likely to be in a British zone of occupation. However, it was not the Red Army, but the Red Navy that they needed to fear. Not far from where the Wilhelm Gustloff went down three months earlier, the Soviet submarine L-3 was lurking. The commander, Captain Vladimir Konovalov, knew that the ships would have to come from hell and he had been waiting for hours. When the convoy was spotted, the submarine surfaced to get into firing range. At 23.52, the submarine could get a good shot at the target, the largest ship in the convoy, the Goya. Konovalov gave the order and four torpedoes shot through the Baltic Sea. Two of the torpedoes missed but one hit the forecastle, the second amidships. Huge holes appeared in the hull and water flooded through. Within seconds the ship listed to starboard. Many were killed by the impacts, most drowning in the flooding water. 
Hardly anyone managed to get through their loading hatches to the top, but even that did not guarantee survival. Witnesses on the other ships later reported that cries for help and screams pierced the night, but there was nothing they could do. Within seven minutes, the freighter sank to the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Thousands were trapped below deck. Only one lifeboat was lowered into the water, but it immediately capsized as countless drowning people clung to its side. Even the life jackets were of little help. Nobody could survive for very long in the three-degree cold water. Within a few minutes, the cries for help died away. The life jackets kept the frozen bodies afloat. Some people did manage to get onto the floating boxes, planks, or a few life rafts that managed to stay afloat. As soon as the first explosion occurred, the convoy scattered. The Mercata, with 5,500 refugees on board, went full steam ahead, leaving the other ships behind. The minesweeper M328 attempted to find the submarine to prevent further torpedo attacks. The water tanker Agia and the second minesweeper attempted to rescue the shipwrecked. Once the submarine was lost, the M328 also started to help find those people in the sea. The exact number of survivors is not clear as some people died after being pulled out of the water, mainly from hypothermia. Around 165 to 177 survivors from more than 7,000 people on board were found, including 28 that were rescued by other ships in the hours that followed. The Goya went down very quickly. The reason is that the freighter it does not have the same structural security measures that were common for warships. The what-if questions that spring to mind include what if it had not had to stop? Was being in a convoy in this case more dangerous given that the vessel could have travelled twice as quickly and would not have been held up? The Soviet submarine knew the route the ships would have to take and was waiting in ambush, but it did have to surface to catch up. Had the Goya been going full speed then it would not have been able to catch up. However, the submarine would have caught the other ships carrying refugees instead if there had not been a convoy, then there would have been more target opportunities. In a situation like this where there were security vessels which might have been armed with depth charges, then the submarine needed to fire and then escape. Without the security vessels, then it could keep firing until the target sinks or it runs out of ammunition. Although Konolov received the country's highest award and became a hero of the Soviet Union for his wartime service, the Soviet Union itself disputed the sinking for a very long time. The conning tower of the L3 can be seen today in the World War II Museum at Park Pobede in Moscow. Two weeks after the loss of the Goya, Hitler committed suicide. The exact number of people on the ship is not knowing, but as many as 150,000 people may have been evacuated from hell before the end of the war. 58 years to the day on the 17th of April 2003, the wreck of the Goya was discovered at a depth of 76 metres at the bottom of the Baltic Sea off the Polish coast. If you're interested to know more about the other ships which sunk in the Baltic during the final weeks of World War II, then you can find them on this channel. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours Central European time and sometimes at other times as well. So if you'd like to subscribe and press the bell, then you'll know when I'm uploading videos of this nature. Thanks for listening.